webinar. Um, we have Dr. Sama Bilal from, um, the, from Drexel University. He is an assistant professor in the Department of Epidemiology and Biostatistics at the Dorn Smith School of Public Health. And he will be talking today on health, equality, health inequalities in Latin American cities. Um, his primary area of research is in the macro social determinants of health with an interest in looking at um, health inequalities in, and health inequities in urban environments and specifically looking at urban health in Latin American cities. He also studies the health consequences of urban and neighborhood dynamics and the effect of mass influences such as microeconomic changes on health and policy modifiers and looking at how these mitigate and exacerbate those effects. Um, he did his training at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health in cardiovascular epi, where we were classmates, which is an exciting um, note. And he also received training in, MP, in his MPH and his MD from um, the Universidad de Alcala in the Universidad de Oviedo in Spain. So with that, I'll hand it over. Thank you. Thank you for the kind of in introduction and thank you for the invitation to, 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 to speak today. Uh, so uh, today I want to talk about uh, the importance of studying uh, health inequalities in, in Latin American cities. Now I'll, I'll start by uh, making the case for why uh, studying urban health and specifically urban health inequalities is important, followed by why this is important specifically in Latin American uh, cities. So uh, the future of humanity is clearly in cities. Uh, right now, more than half of the world population lives in cities. And actually, if you look at some reports where they change, where they alter the city definition a little bit to make it more, 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 more precise, it is even estimated that 80% of the world population may be living in cities now. So clearly, the future uh, of, of humanity lies, lies in cities, and this has consequences. You can see in this figure, uh, which is from the World Urbanization Prospects of 2014. Um, oh, I think I may not be have my slides being shared. Yeah, now? Yes, yes. Sorry about that. Now. I thought they were. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so, uh, as I was saying, and you can see in this figure uh, from the World Urbanization Prospects of 2014, uh, the future of humanity lies in, in cities. Um, as uh, by uh, 2015, where this data was last uh, up updated, uh, actually places like Europe, uh, Latin America, and North America, and Australia, and other islands in Oceania, yeah. more than 70% uh, of the population living in cities. And while these numbers are lower in Africa and, and Asia, it is actually uh, the places where, where uh, urbanization is, is supposed to grow the most in the, in the following uh, decades. So, uh, that's going to be that's going to have a lot of importance on urban health in those in those in those areas. Now, uh, a key thing of this is that the health implications of city living are, are variable. There is not a universally there is not a universal pattern where a city's growth health improves or health worsens. Uh, and actually, there are some aspects that uh, increase with city size, like density, di diversity of economic activities, economic activities them themselves, and social interactions that don't have a clear association with health. Some of them are positive for some things, some of them are negative for, for some things. There are things that are clearly uh, health damaging, such as pollution, sprawl, processed foods, marketing, overcrowding, and violence that tend to be big, more common in larger cities. And therefore, one would assume maybe larger cities have worse health outcomes. But there are some other things, such as income and work, access to services, advocacy, creativity, the presence of urban policies that tend to be more common in larger cities. And these are things that in most cases are positive for health outcomes. So uh, do bigger cities have better or, or worse outcomes? Are more urbanized areas better or worse for health? It truly depends uh, on what is happening there. Now, one key aspect of city living is that the health consequences of living there are not the same for all. And I love bringing up this example from Chetty and colleagues published in JAMA in 2016, where they evaluated uh, how life expectancy changes with income, finding something that we know very well, which is people with higher incomes have higher life expectancy, so they live for longer. Now, uh, a key aspect of this paper, which doesn't get brought up a lot, is the fact that uh, this is not the same everywhere, and that this gradient varies a lot by depending on where you are. And that actually, while this arrow, you know, the, the increase in life expectancy with increasing income is quite consistent. What happens with this other arrow? 
why are people why why are the poorest people in Detroit living almost living almost eight years shorter than the poorest people in New York? So there is something different about cities, either the people that live in the cities or the context of these cities that creates dif uh, different in inequalities by city. Now, part of the reason behind this is that health in cities is driven by multiple factors. So it's not only your neighborhood, it's not only the city, it's the interaction of both, it's the interaction of who's in your household, it's all of those things that are important. Uh, includes wider, even wider levels, like which region is the city, especially if you think about natural disasters and some environmental outcomes that depends a lot in where in the country uh, you are. But all of these things are interacting and generating this pattern that I mentioned uh, before. Now, the other thing that is happening in cities um, is that things are happening, actually, that there are policies and interventions and programs occurring in these cities. Now, the problem is that we rarely evaluate those. Sometimes we evaluate them for, for, for process, we do, an evaluate, we do an evaluation of whether people attend this kind of program, but we rarely look at, did the program actually do something? Um, as an example here in Latin America, this is a paper from 2012 looking at uh, the um, an intervention in several neighborhoods of Medellin in Colombia, where they look at the this installation of a, of a gondola, a, a, uh, a cable car that connected uh, two very isolated neighborhoods to the downtown area of Medellin, which allowed uh, which increased job opportunities in those areas. And they found that actually the reports of violence and homicides themselves decline a lot more in those neighborhoods that match controls. So something happened when we intervene on neighborhoods. Something happened when we intervene on cities. But if we don't evaluate that, it's very hard to kind of uh, assess. And it's very hard to copy for other cities, of course. Now, with all of these things in mind, this is why we should study urban health. Now, why Latin America? And I will argue one of the key aspects uh, of studying Latin, Latin America is what I said before which is here it is, which is that latin america is one of the most urbanized regions in in the in the world this is the same figure i showed before it has that urbanization has grown a lot in the last 60 years so it's the one that has grown them the most in the last 60 years and it will continue growing so urban areas of latin america is where most of the people in the in the region live now importantly latin america is also one of the most unequal regions in the world as you can see here, this is a map of Gini co coefficients, which um, higher Gini co co coefficients essentially mean there is wider income inequality. And as you can see, Latin America, along with, along with a lot of sub-Saharan Africa, is some, are some of the most unequal countries in the world. So it's a highly urbanized and highly unequal region of the, of the world. Now, in order to be able to, to, to study urban health patterns in Latin America, uh, Drexel University started the Salurbal project, Salud Urbana in America Latina, Urban Health in Latin America, which is, has a few more months to, to, to go. Uh, it was funded by the, by the Welcome Trust and it includes 14 partners across the region in a total of, of 11 countries. I see here this part of Welcome Trust, our planet, our health global initiative. And while this may seem like a minor detail, part of this in, involves the idea that this project is not only looking at urban health, it's also looking at health inequalities and it's also looking at the consequences of environmental aspects such as climate change, et cetera, et cetera. So it, it tries to include this one health uh, approach to the study of urban health. As I said, it's 15 uh, partners across the region where we collect data in 11 of these in 11 of these of these countries. And uh, part of the objectives of this of this project are to engage with policymakers uh, to be able to kind of de de determine policy relevant research priorities. Approaches we did a few years ago in a meeting with policymakers in, in Mexico, policymakers from all of the region. And the idea there is with these, we are going to be able or have been able to evaluate several um, health, environmental, and equity impact of policies and interventions, identify city and neighborhood drivers of health and health inequalities, which is most of what I will be talking about today, and also employ systems thinking and simulations to evaluate the plausible impacts of combinations of policies in the region. And the idea is that this hopefully will bring us some lessons from Latin America to hopefully part of other cities in the world about what makes them healthier, equitable, and more environmentally sustainable to then go back 
to engaging with uh, the, both the scientific community and the public and policymakers on these on these findings. So let me go a little bit more in detail into some of the results we've been finding in, in this part, in this game, the identify city and neighborhood drivers of health and health in inequalities. Uh, so for this, we spent quite a lot of time identifying a city universe. I'll go into detail now. And that may seem like something that is easy, right? A city is a city. And I know a city when I see it, it turns out to be way more complicated than one could think. What is a city? What was the threshold for when something becomes a city? Where are the boundaries of the city? Where do we put the limits there? Uh, those are very tricky things. Uh, second aspect is harmonizing data across 11 countries with very different data collection systems, very different surveys, very different vital rate tracer, all of those kind of things. And then it's time to do the actual research after that. So the first aspect, we decided, after a lot of thinking, to come up with the city universe of uh, urban agglomerations that had more than 100,000 people by 2010. We had to put a threshold somewhere. We decided on this round number that has been used in other similar uh, studies. And we define urban agglomerations essentially as combinations of local administrative units, think counties in the US, um, that, uh, that overlap with the urban extent of a city. In a way, this definition, the units are similar to core-based uh, statistical areas in the US, which a lot of people may know as metropolitan statistical areas, because they are made of county-like units. Um, and with this, we identify these 371 cities, which importantly, not only include those big cities that everyone knows about. This is not only Buenos Aires, Sao Paulo, Rio, Santiago, Mexico City, uh, Panama, San Salvador, etc. It's not only these cities, it's everything else below that too, which is very, very important because actually most people live down here because that's, that's where most of the cities are. Most cities are small cities and that's where most of the people live. So that's also part of this study. It's not only a study about Buenos Aires and Santiago, although you will see more results on those cities because it's easier to look at data in those cities, but still we try to incorporate as many cities as possible in, in, all, of our, in all of our studies. So I'll, I'll, I'll give you a brief taste of results. Um, First of a few things we've published over the last two or three years, and then a few things that are currently uh, being, uh, being uh, done. So the first set of results I highlight, it's uh, three, well, two papers describing three sets of results uh, on how life expectancy and longevity varies between cities. Then it, in order to understand why that varies, well, how, how, what, how do causes of that cause of specific mortality vary across those cities? It's similar, it's very different across the, the, the cities. And then and another one where we are looking specifically within some of these cities, how does life expectancy and longevity vary uh, then? You want more details on the upper set of results? We published this paper in Nature Medicine in 2021. Google that, you'll be able to find that paper. And this one down here was published in 2019. And both have accompanying interactive apps where you can uh, el elaborate on these results even further, look at things on your own, etc. So in all of these cases, uh, the setting for all of them is 2012 to 2016. We pull data for that uh, whole period. Uh, for the between city analysis, we look at 363 cities in nine countries, which are Argentina, Brazil, Chile, Colombia, Mexico, um, El Salvador, Panama, Costa Rica, and Peru, yeah, nine uh, countries. Uh, and we use the city as a unit of analysis, as I said before, understood as an agglomeration of local administrative units that are covered by the built-up extent of the city. For the other one, the smaller paper looking at six large cities, we leverage cities that have a lot of component units. So we could understand the heterogeneity within those cities. And we chose Buenos Aires, Belo Horizonte, Santiago, San Jose, Panama, and Ciudad de Mexico. Mexico City, uh, and look at the, the component administrative units of these cities, called, depending on the country, communas, municipios, districts, or cantones. Um, so for that, we use vital registration, so mortality records with age, sex, and cause of death were needed, and population projections by age and, by age and sex. Now, one tricky aspect of estimating life expectancy and mortality in general is that not all of these countries, not all of these cities are in countries with vital registration systems that have very good coverage. And by very good coverage, I mean that not all deaths are covered in these countries. Um, this is something that most studies in the US 
don't really have to worry about, although there is undercounting for specific causes of death. Paper two days ago uh, from the IHME in the University of Washington that was describing undercounting in police deaths in the US. So undercounting also happens in the US. But uh, here is uh, in some of these countries, undercounting is much more uh, sy systematic. For example, on average, 40% of all deaths in Peru don't get registered. So if we were to use that data assist, we'll miss a lot of deaths, we'll overestimate life expectancy. So we use an, a, an ensemble of death distribution methods, which are ways to estimate this undercounting. Um, now, after correcting for all of this, we use life tables uh, uh, to, to estimate life, life expectancy. The mortality rates for these life tables were obtained from a Bayesian Poisson model that tries to smooth mortality rates towards city level means for within city analysis or country level means for uh, between city uh, and, and analysis. And we did comparisons of cities within and between countries and then also within the cities themselves, depending on the, on the paper. And just to give you a sense of this undercounting thing that I just mentioned, uh, this is from another paper that we are working on now, trying to describe the quality of vital registration across these cities. And uh, as you can see here, this I think this country here is Peru, where you can see a lot of the cities and in red, which we define as a deficient coverage, which is less than 70% of all deaths are registered in these countries. And actually up here is Iquitos in Loreto, which was a huge, huge hotspot for COVID-19 at the beginning of the pandemic. In Iquitos, only 20% of all deaths are, are covered by the vital registration system, we estimate. So clearly in some areas, uh, these, um, vital registration systems are quite deficient and we need to acknowledge and incorporate that into our models and actually some of these Bayesian models that we've been using try to incorporate uncertainty around this around this estimation of of undercounting you can see that there's also some deficient some city with deficient or fair systems in colombia and in mexico while luckily most of the other countries have very good vital registration or at least very good coverage of, of deaths so for the cost specific mortality part, there is a second concern that we have, and that's another concern that is always uh, present when looking at vital registration, which is uh, ill-defined causes of death, also known as the garbage codes. These have very different names in the literature. This is essentially those deaths that you cannot really code to anything that is useful in public health wise. For example, ICD-10 code R99, which is anything, any cause of death, other causes of death, that's not something we can use uh, in, for any uh, purpose. So what we try to do is to get closer to the burden of a group of diseases is to redistribute those ill-defined deaths using information on age, sex, country, and year. This is imperfect. Uh, we know that we didn't wanna go any further because we there are other uh, ways of looking at this much more precisely, but they require a ton of assumption that we didn't want to go into. Now, after doing this, we classified all deaths specifically into five uh, groups. Uh, on, on one side, communicable maternal, neonatal, and nutritional deaths, big group there. Uh, cancer, then cardiovascular and all other non-communicable deaths, think diabetes, liver disease, respiratory diseases, etc. Then unintentional injuries, which is mostly traffic crashes, but also includes falls. It includes some other accidents, it includes drug overdoses, etc. And then intentional injuries, which in the region for most of the countries is mostly homicides, but also includes uh, suicides. Um, and then we also look at what, what are the factors that are associated with these, uh, with these patterns, both with life expectancy and with um, uh, cost-specific mortality. And we look at this set of factors chosen to be very broad, uh, we, did, we were not looking at very specific factors, so we're not looking to do any causal analysis at all. Just describe how life expectancy or cost specific mortality varies by levels of these factors. Uh, we use population size as one of them, then population growth during the study period, uh, three landscape metrics, uh, population density, then urban stock fragmentation, which tells you how fragmented is the seed development. Is it a big blurb of urban extent or is it separated areas, very uh, sprawled? and then street connectivity as a marker of um, walkability in the cities. Uh, and then as social variables, we did a, we, we look at all of these ones independently, but then we also created an index, a social environment index that includes the Z scores of education, specifically complete the proportion of the population with completed primary education. We look at housing overcrowding, which is the proportion of households with more than three people per room. 
um, the household, uh, access to water, just the proportion of household with water in the dwelling, um, and then connection to the sewage uh, network. And these last two are intended to be a market of formal or informal development in, in, this, in the cities. Okay, so let's look a little bit into results after all of these explanations. So this is the uh, first key result that I like highlighting from this, from this study, is the enormous variability we observe within countries. We are looking at here, on the y-axis is life expectancy at birth. Uh, so for someone born today, and if current mortality patterns were sold into the future, this is on average how someone expected to, to, to live. So it's in a, in, a, in a way, a way to convert mortality rates into years of life with all of the assumptions that I just mentioned. Um, each, each circle in this figure is a city. So somewhere in here is Buenos Aires, somewhere in here is Mexico City, etc. Each column, so to speak, is a country. So Argentina, Brazil, Chile, Colombia, Costa Rica, Mexico, Panama, Peru, and El Salvador. And then on the left is life expectancy among women, and on the right is life expectancy among men. And for me, one of the key results here is that if you compare the median life expectancy in the city with the highest life expectancy, which will be either Chile or Costa Rica, depending on whether you're looking at men or women, and where to compare that with a country with the lowest median life expectancy, that will be Mexico in both cases, that difference is narrower than the difference within Mexico itself. So in a way, Mexico contains more heterogeneity within it than all of our countries put together. So uh, we have a lot of heterogeneity within these countries. And I mentioned this because life expectancy is a typical thing we think of as in a country, actually, right? Life expectancy in the US has fallen. Well, this last year didn't fall. Well, it did fall, but not the previous one. Um, but life expectancy has been stagnant in the US, right? And at most, we separate it by race, ethnicity, or by sex, et cetera. But when we look at within the countries, we see a lot of variability in there. And actually, in Mexico, there are almost 10 years of variability, especially among men. So the city with the highest and the lowest variability, 10 years of difference between them. Uh, that's the case for Mexico, that's the case for Brazil, and that's the case for Colombia. And we'll go into detail later, but a lot of this has to do with violence, uh, specifically homicide deaths that mostly affect men in these countries and mostly affect young men. By affecting young men, they actually decrease life expectancy a, a lot, because those early deaths tend to affect life expectancy a lot more than the later deaths. But we also observe quite a lot of variability in other places, such as Argentina or Peru. You can see here quite a lot of variability within these countries. So thing number one here, there is very heterogeneous life expectancy uh, between cities, even within the same uh, country. And now to bring this point home, um, sorry, to bring this point home, what I'm showing in this figure, the same cities with confidence intervals, because we like confidence intervals to know a little bit of the variability. Uh, and all of the countries together and sorted by the, by the life expectancy of the city. So up here on the right is a city in, I think in Chile, and down here is a city in Mexico. So all of them are sorted. And the horizontal lines here are the life expectancy for countries in each World Bank income group. So up here, this city in Chile, which actually I believe is Santiago, uh, has a life expectancy that is similar to that of high income countries as a whole. And if we were to place a country up here, that would be Germany. So Santiago has the same life expectancy as a whole as Germany. If we were to place the US here, the US would be somewhere in here, like down here. So a couple of years lower than Germany. Now, if we go down, 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 and go below lower middle income countries and go to a life expectancy that is not that different from that of India, we find Acapulco in Mexico. It's a well-known city, I will say, a beach resort in Mexico, where we'll show later, 20% of all deaths are actually homicides, which reduces life expectancy by a lot. And you can see here, it's lower than all other cities here. So in a way, life expectancy, especially among men in, in these Latin American cities, represents a huge variability that almost covers the entire world there. Variability, as I said, is slightly narrower among women, but still, the low, cities with the lowest life, life expectancy down here are not that far from middle income countries. And that's considering all of the countries we are studying in our study are, are upper middle or high income countries, all of them. So they should all be around here, but you can see that some of them go down and some of them even uh, go up there. 
Now, spatially speaking, uh, what I'm showing in this map is the same data, so life expectancy on the left women, on the right men, Rather the color, lower life expectancy, greener the color will be higher life, life expectancy with different legends for men and women. Uh, and as you can see here, a few patterns emerge. One of them that I like to point out is Brazil, where we actually have the biggest amount of cities, uh, 152. And as you can see, you have a clear pattern where the south and southeast of Brazil, both among men and women, tends to have cities in the green or even yellow. So cities with higher life expectancy, while the north and the northeast especially, and the northeast especially for men, tends to have cities in the red, that is with lowest life expectancy. So huge variability within Brazil, but we also see this in, in Argentina. You see a clear north pattern, north-south pattern with higher, with, sorry, with lower life expectancy in the northern cities of Argentina. And in Mexico, you see a pattern of higher life expectancy in the Central Valley, and lower life expectancy in the north and in the south, and especially down up here, is Acapulco and other cities in Guerrero where the lowest life expectancy can be found. So clear uh, spatial pattern across the, across the continent. Now, when it comes to the uh, determin or not the determinants, do not speak causally, but the factors associated with uh, life expectancy to emerge very clearly. Uh, one of them is the social environment index, nothing new there cities with higher levels of educational attainment, lower overcrowding, higher water access, and higher sewage connections. So improved living conditions have much higher life expectancy. And actually, per one standard deviation, we have a 0.7 and 0.5 years increase in life expectancy in those, in those cities. The other factor that we found to be uh, strongly associated with life expectancy is population growth during the study period. Uh, two key things here. One of them is areas that where fewer people die. Well, more population growth will be higher now in the continent as it is right now the main driver of population growth is migration actually so uh we believe that these things to be tested yes are, uh, are showing cities that are thriving and therefore you, you have more migrants going into them and the thriving cities will have higher life expectancy now that's speculation for now but that's that's what we are working under and would love to be able to test that into the future with new migration data that we have now that's how long people live. Another aspect is what do they die of? Like why are some cities, why do some cities have lower life expectancy? And for this, what, what we did is compute a very simple indicator, which is proportionate mortality, which is the proportion of all deaths that are due to a specific cause. And what we have in this figure is uh, on the y-axis is the proportionate mortality, and then on the x-axis is every city. So each of these bars is a city. This will be a city in Peru, this will be a city in Argentina, these are cities in Mexico, each bar of them, etc. Uh, the blue part here are the proportion of deaths that are due to communicable maternal, neonatal, and nutritional deaths. Red are deaths that are due to cancer. Yellow, deaths that are due to cardiovascular and other non-communicable. Purple are unintentional injuries, mostly traffic crashes. And uh, green is violent injuries, mostly uh, homicides. And we see a few patterns here. The first two I want to highlight is communicable maternal, neonatal, and nutritional deaths. That's a, that's a mouthful. That um, varies a lot by country, actually. And we have that Peruvian cities as a whole tend to have much higher levels of this. And there are actually some cities with very high numbers uh, in, of, of these deaths that uh, do not even overlap with the other countries. While, for example, in Chile, this number is much lower than in all of the other countries. Um, the other one is cancer that has a similar pattern where cities in, in Argentina and Chile tend to have higher levels than in the other countries, probably due to population aging. Uh, the other pattern I want to highlight is a set of causes of death that vary a lot within country, and that's all of the injuries, both unintentional and intentional or violent injuries. And actually, we sorted this figure by the proportion of violent injuries by country. And you can see, for example, in Mexico, we have some cities with almost 20% of all deaths due to violent injuries homicides mostly, that would be Acapulco, and down here, a city with 2% of all deaths due to violent injury, that would be Merida in Yucatan. So we have a tenfold difference between cities in Mexico in terms of violent deaths, huge variability there, and that actually mirrors what we saw before with life expectancy, because Brazil and Colombia are the other two countries where this is going on, huge variability uh, within them. 
Now, uh, as with life expectancy, we also check to see what is associated with these factors. Only here we had the opportunity, since we are looking at five variables, of looking at them at the same time and trying to see how the proportionate more mortality, essentially, how will this figure change if we were to sort it by the social environment index and smooth it a little bit, because otherwise it would be very noisy. Uh, we did this with the lowest smoother and proportionate more mortality by each cause and then added them up, stacked them up. Um, and what we found is it's a pattern that kind of resembles epidemiological transitions in which uh, cities with the lowest uh, social environment index have around 20% of deaths are due to communicable maternal, neonatal and nutritional deaths. And while cities with the highest social environment index, 10% of deaths are due to that. Now that this transition, this 10% change is essentially replaced by at first cardiovascular deaths and then cardiovascular and other NCDs and then color deaths. So we have a replaced a transition from communicable to cardiovascular to then cancer. Uh, violent and, uh, and intentional injuries do not vary a lot at the beginning. They are a little bit lower in, in cities with the highest social environment index, but before that they, are, they don't follow a clear pattern. They're showing that regardless of the level of the development, cities are equal, have similar values of these, of these uh, types of deaths. And one thing I want to highlight of these patterns is that this is all with a cross-sectional analysis, 2012 to 2016. So we aren't even looking longitudinally here, where these changes will be even more marked. We are looking at a cross-sectional sample here. And the fact that we can reproduce more or less the transitions in a cross-sectional sample says a lot, a lot about the importance of the social environment in determining what people are dying from. Now, as I said before, the other thing we did is not only look up here, at how life expectancy and cost specific mortality varies by between cities, but also we look into detail in, into some of these cities, particularly the large ones where we have enough variability. And I just want to show two examples here, Santiago and Buenos Aires, the Gran Buenos Aires, where we actually in Santiago, we found uh, in the pooled analysis, almost a 15 year difference between the lowest and the highest life expectancy by Comuna of Santiago, that life expectancy pattern follows a pattern well known in Chile, which is in, in Santiago, which is this, this cone in the northeast of the city where the wealthiest population lives, it's called the Barrio Alto of, of Santiago, uh, which if you put a COVID map here, it will show the same thing, et cetera, et cetera. This is reproducing all of the social inequalities we know from Santiago are shown here in life expectancy. In the case of Buenos Aires, again, same thing within the core city of Buenos Aires, we have a north, south pattern with higher life expectancy in, in the north uh, and then that higher life expectancy actually extends into the northern suburbs of the city which are the wealthiest of the city if any of you follows argentina that's well of the carpincho crisis the cap the capybara crisis has occurred in buenos aires where the uh, where these little animals had invaded wealthy people's house in those in those areas they wanted to keep them out there was a whole thing in this. so that's all up here very high life expectancy in there. So, uh, and actually we found between the north and the south of the city, uh, north is especially marked where the, for those of you that follow soccer, is where the River Plate Stadium is, and down here is where the Boca Junior Stadium is. They 6.5 miles separate the two stadiums, and actually 6.5 years of life expectancy separate uh, the two commun the two communes, yes, where the stadiums are. So very big differences. Uh, we look at uh, this is all of the cities in that study. We look at how life expectancy varies by levels of education. We found that with the exception of Costa Rica, um, in all of the others, with the exception of Jose de Costa Rica, in all of the other cities, we found a positive and significant slope so that higher levels of education are associated with higher life expectancy uh, there. Uh, and then this is what we have done, and this is what we are working on now. We decided that looking at these comunas, it's maybe not granular enough because there may be differences within them. So we were able to obtain actually census tract level equivalent mortality for the city of Buenos Aires. And this is work in progress that we are working on right now. Uh, this is essentially the same map I showed before in green, but in blue, and using a much smaller uh, unit here. And again, we find even wider inequalities, which is kind of 
it makes sense because we're looking at smaller units, so there is a lot more variability here. We find an eight year difference between the lowest and the highest levels. Sorry, nine year difference between the lowest and the highest life expectancies. In the case of women, we found a very similar pattern with this north south pattern. And we found it's strongly associated with things like such as education. We've looked at a whole other set of variables, all of them show a very clear uh, association. As I said before, we are not only looking at Buenos Aires and the big cities, but we've repeated this in Cordoba, in Argentina, third biggest city in the country, but we found very similar this, very similar this, this disparities, almost nine years, and a very similar uh, strong correlation between education and life expectancy. But then 2020 come, and you know, I will be remiss if I didn't mention some of COVID-19 stuff in the continent. And the reason why I will be remiss if I didn't do this, because I will argue Latin America has been the most affected region in the world so far up until now. We'll see what happens in the future as vaccination continues being so unequally distributed across the world. But so far, Latin America has suffered some of the most uh, devastating effects of the, of the pandemic. We published a brief on this can find on this link down here in our in our website. But in summary, um, first of all, what I wanted to mention is that even when, then this is by, I think, up to June of 2021, a few months ago, even considering that Latin America has a much younger pop population than the USA, Canada, and Europe, it still had almost the same crude confirmed COVID-19 deaths. That's considering it's much younger than all of those other regions. So the effects have been truly, truly devastating there. And actually, more and more new research is coming, examining changes in life expectancy in the last year. And Latin American countries have been clearly some of the most affected, even, even beyond some widely known hotspots such as New York, Italy, etc. Et, et, et and now, contrary to what some uh, policymakers and politicians may tell you in the region. This is a statement from last year from the Minister of Health in Chile, where he said that there is no relationship between mortality or lethality and poverty, because that would mean there is a discrimination going on. Well, uh, of course, as you may imagine, that's not the case. We look at data for Chile. Uh, we This is for Santiago de Chile, very similar. On the we computed age-adjusted mortality by Comuna in Chile and look at how it correlated with average years of schooling. We did that for the 16 to 19 period and then for 2020. The summary I will say here is that the slope was, you know, there was this slope and then there was a much steeper slope. So changes in mortality were actually concentrated up here where the low with the communas with the lowest levels of education. There is clearly a relationship between lethality and poverty even if the government of Chile doesn't want to kind of uh, admit it. And there have been many papers on this, specifically on, on Santiago de, de Chile as an example of inequality in the region. Now, the other thing I want to mention is that there are other inequalities that are a little bit more hidden. This is a paper we published last week or the week before that in AGPH, where we just examined excess mortality during the COVID-19 pandemic in Guatemala. And this figure is actually buried in the appendix because it wasn't part of the main thing we wanted to show there. But I want to bring up today because what we look at here is the number of deaths that occur at home and the number of deaths that occur in, hospital, in hospitals in Guatemala in 2020 and in the average of the five previous years. And uh, the interesting thing here is that, well, there's this decline in mortality as the lockdown started, which it's happened in many places where COVID-19 came a little bit later and the lockdowns actually reduced mortality because there were no traffic accidents, lower pollution, lower violence, a lot of things happened there that reduced more mortality. And then you have this increase, right, with the big peak that Guatemala had in July and in August. And then it started going down and then it started hiding at home, right? That didn't happen in hospitals. In hospitals, actually, mortality went back to previous year's levels. And the key reason is that in order to get into a hospital, you needed to pay a huge deposit. So the poor could not access hospitals at all. Access was completely out because they were completely overburdened, et cetera, et cetera. And this thing that shows what may seem like just a few lines are a reflection of the inequalities that are occurring in, 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 in some of these countries uh, where people didn't have access to to care and a lot of them were having to die at home, essentially, without any uh, support uh, at all. Now, the other thing I want to mention with regards to uh, in inequalities in the region, 
This comes from something we published a month ago where we studied the relationship between mobility, population level mobility and COVID-19 incidence. And we found that a reduction in mobility as the lockdowns were occurring was associated with a reduction in the case rate. Um, now, what I want to bring up is that this is another exploration we did later, uh, where we explore the levels of mobility by the level of SCS of the area where people were living. And if you look at here, this is for 300 cities in Latin America combined. I want you to look at this part here, because it's rare that we see a dose response so clear. Uh, this is high SCS, this is medium high SCS, this is middle SCS, this is mid low SCS, and this is low SCS. And what you find is that the Areas that decline mob mobility the most are the areas with the highest SCS. That is, mobility, sorry, SCS, afforded people the ability to stay at home. And if you connect that with that, I think the message is clear is that those were the people that were able to avoid uh, COVID 19 in those, in those cities. So, to summarize, Latin America is one of the most urbanized and unequal regions in the world. Uh, we have seen, and I have shown that mortality across and within cities in the region is highly heterogeneous, and this is highly associated with social factors and living conditions. And last, that the COVID-19 pandemic has magnified all of these inequalities. And I think it's important to continue tracking these because some countries in the region have been uh, great examples of how to, back, how to vaccinate quick, how to vaccinate everyone. Chile and Uruguay, for example, have almost 80% full vaccination rates, way above the US, but some other, including, for example, Guatemala, have some have uh, less than 15%. So all of these things com combined will, will increase these inequalities in the future. And that's something that we should be really uh, concerned about and keep monitoring. And I welcome any questions that you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Sama. That was great. Um, does anybody have any questions they'd like to ask? So I have, or maybe, do you mind going into a little bit of detail about what some of the reasons um, might be for having deaths undercounted in some of these areas? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and I think part of it is that, um, part, part of it requires um, understanding what happens when a death happens. How, how does a death end up in a vital registration system, right? There has to be a death certificate field. Depending on the country, even here in the US, it varies within the country who can fill that vital registration, well, that, that certificate, right? Then that death certificate goes somewhere. That somewhere does something with it that then goes somewhere else. And that's the data that we end up getting. Now, if there is a misstep in any of those places, if that certificate is not produced, if the local office, for some reason, doesn't send it to the national office, if the national office doesn't have a good way of keeping track of all of those things, then a death may not be uh, counted. It truly really depends on the country. We have found that, for example, in Peru, a lot of it has to do with uh, all of this being very decentralized and the provincial offices having to take care of all of those uh, vital registration systems, which generates a lot of heterogeneity within the country, which is problematic because we cannot use a country level correction. We have to do a local level cor correction there. Now, um, another reason why it may happen is because no one knows of that death. And I will argue that's the key reason for Mexican uh, undercounting there. There's, I think, it was a New York Times article from a couple of days ago talking about the 100,000 missing people in Mexico in the last two decades due to the war on drugs created by the US, essentially. Uh, that has created more than 100,000 missing people. Missing, not dead. So they don't have a death, a death certificate. A number of them may 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 be dead, but those people are not counted in the vital registration system. Now, what I find most problematic is when that undercounting is socially patterned, because then what we may see is that areas with higher levels of poverty may actually have lower mortality because we don't count those deaths. So I will argue we have a right to live and a right to health and all of these things, but we also have a right for our deaths to be counted. <laughs> And that's something that isn't really clear everywhere. Same thing as we have a right for the births to be registered, which also doesn't happen everywhere. The same thing happens with that. Now, ways of fixing this include specific policies like mandating the registration, 
uh, things like mm, pensions and things like that being linked to IDs, etc. All, all of this is linked to, in some cases, to welfare systems. Now, I want to highlight that there are countries that have done a good job at improving this. Peru has done a great job at improving this in the last four or five years, creating an electronic registration system that uh, we haven't evaluated that, but I've seen a couple of papers on that and that has improved things. And for example, Guatemala, which we did not include in the analysis for the following reason, uh, tried to, uh, its best to include all deaths, even if the deaths were, didn't have all of the data with them. So in, in, in Guatemala, in order to improve, in order to improve under counting or to improve the counting of, of deaths, anyone can, not anyone, but death registration can be signed in any, in any format. So if someone dies, you can sign the, the registration, someone that is eligible to sign it on any piece of paper. So what that means is that a lot of data may be missing. And that's why we didn't use the data for Guatemala because of specific types of uh, variables that were missing, but still all of the deaths, most of the deaths are counted there. So there is this balanced trade-off between quality of data and how many deaths are counted. Uh, but yeah, that's a, that's a pretty concerning thing. And it, as I said, it's not a thing of Latin America. In the US, half of police deaths haven't been counted in the last 30 years, haven't been counted as police deaths. So that's, that's also that also matters how you go to those deaths. Yeah, and on a related note, uh, Lisa Miller has a question, um, which is, uh, can you also, sorry, can you also talk about the specific methods you use to estimate the undercount? Seems like that would be very, or seems like that would be challenging and labor intensive. Yeah, so there are, there are, there are a lot of these methods. Thank you for this question. And some of them are, are methods that actually are very labor intensive and include surveys. So, uh, for example, one of the, a method that is similar to this was used to first estimate the, the effects of Hurricane Maria in Puerto Rico, where you actually do surveys of people and ask them, did anyone die in your household? What was their death, et cetera, et cetera. And then you compare that with vital registration. And then you say, okay, I estimate 4,000 deaths. And this, and the vital registration estimates 1,000. So there is another counting of 75% or something like that. That's one method that's very labor intensive. Another method includes review of documents like newspapers, et cetera, try to come up with a number of deaths. What we use is are, are known as um, death distribution methods, which essentially what they do is if you have population at two points in time and the age of the people in that po population, you know that someone that was 10 today should be 20 in 10 years, right? So if that person didn't die, that they should be counted here in the new census or your new population estimation here. So what essentially you use is those facts, the fact that people age in a very predictable manner, and the fact that you have the registration of their deaths to see this is the amount of deaths I will expect in this area. This is the amount of deaths that I observe. And then you kind of compare them by age group. There are several methods to do this, and then several age bands at which you estimate this. And that's what we did. We did three methods, three age bands, and we used that to come up with a, with a range. We believe undercounting is from here to here. And that distribution is what we input in the Bayesian model, telling it we know that undercounting in this city is somewhere between 30 and 50%. So let's acknowledge life expectancy uh, there. Now, the reason why age bands are important is because one of the key assumptions of these methods is that there is no migration. Because you may imagine, you have these people here, these people here, some people died, but some people came in and some people went out. So uh, what we do is we try to estimate this undercounting in bands that we know have lower migration, the elderly mostly. Because if you estimate this in people 20 to 30, there's a lot of people coming in and coming out of these cities, especially the bigger ones where people go to study, things like that. Um, let's see, we have another question uh, that is, how does the team measure the variations in social network and the group level resilience to survive and succeed in the micro le macro level disparities across countries and cities? A big question. <laughs> um, so uh, just as an example of something we have done related to, to this is, I think I mentioned before, we are uh, one of the things we are working on is on um, evaluating a number of policies. And one of the ones that we are evaluating is, a, is another cable car, in this case in Bogota, in the city of Bogota, the capital of Colombia. So there are two very poor neighborhoods uh, with like, commuting from there to the city center. It's like 90 minutes if you do it regularly. And now they install this cable car in one of them. They will install it on the other later, uh, where that cuts the commuting time to like 15 minutes. 
right? So it, it really improves uh, uh, the living conditions there. And we are comparing that neighborhood to the other one where they, it will be installed later, so kind of like a step wedge design. Um, now, one of the things we are doing there is doing a qualitative in qualitative interviews with the people there to ask them specifically how social networks in those three in those in that neighborhood are changing because you have more work opportunities but you also have another issue which is those neighborhoods are now far more desirable so property prices are going up in a way a form it's not gentrification because it's a different mechanism but it, it is the same thing and that has a danger of breaking up these social networks because people will be excluded even farther away to areas where the cable car doesn't go now the tricky thing here is that i'm telling you about a qualitative thing in one neighborhood in one of the cities we have 371 more to go so uh i think measuring in my view measuring social networks and this at the macro level is very very tricky and we haven't really gotten into that in depth, only in these case studies. That's how we have tried to approach it. Great. And then I was just curious if you um, would touch on like what you think some of the impacts of climate change are going to be having on some of the factors you talked about, especially you know, given a lot of the migration from rural areas into cities. Um, yeah, it's it's. That's another big one. That's that's I, that's actually our next one of the next objectives of this project. I mentioned is finishing soon, but one of the ideas for continuation here is focusing on that mostly. Uh, Latin America will be Latin America will be one of the regions that will have the highest amount of climate refugees, especially in Central America. Not will have is having now. Like that's part of the migration wave from Central America is people escaping violence and climate change and violence caused by climate change. Um, so uh, one of the studies we, we we have is a study where what we are doing is um, examining by city what is the relationship between temperature and more mortality and then projecting to 2050 if the IPCC pro projections happen at each of the different levels for car for carbon reductions how many more deaths will will we be expecting in those in those cities so that's one of the big ones that we are looking at the other one. Uh, it relates to pollution. We are looking at a lot of, of studies on pollution. That's not directly a cause of climate change, but it's a, a correlate of, of it because Latin America it keeps growing. Mot motorized transport keeps and keeps and keeps growing. And it's growing exponentially in a lot of these countries. And we are looking at uh, how the distribution of, of pollutants happens within these cities because that's another thing is who is exposed and who is exposed to air pollution is something that is also not random. And that's the, the other big thing that, that we are uh, looking at. Okay. And we are actually related to your own interest. Uh, we are looking <laughs> at, at one, uh, uh, one an analysis examining disparities in COVID-19 side by side with disparities in dengue, uh, which I will argue, you can tell me about that more, is another of the things that will change a lot with climate change, the distribution of dengue, et cetera. That's something that will probably change a lot and those disparities may also change in, in the future. Yeah, that's really interesting. And I have to say with dengue, there's the same geographic heterogeneity that you're seeing in your results. So I think it's really interesting that there's so many parallels with those types yeah. of um, analyses. Um, well, we're at near the end of the time. If there Are there any other questions for Dr. Bilal? All right, well, thank you so much for joining us. It was a great lecture. Um, and and I think we'll end it there. Thanks so thank much. You. Thank you so much for the for the invitation and thank you everyone for the questions. Everybody.